You don't ever want to be there. I'll tell you that. I laid my hand on her shoulder and I began to call to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he got in the lungs and all the windpipe and he opened that all up so she could breathe. We want to thank Jesus. I was talking to Charles. I was so burdened. Uh, uh, sometimes of his eight children, I'll be burdened for the second or the third. And this week, I don't know how many times I've been burdened for different ones of the children. And this one man that works in uh, New Orleans, God revealed to me that we had to get a hold of God. And for God, he would have been killed. He would have lost his life. He really would. The knife didn't miss, uh, I don't know how far the heart. But God revealed this in that we want to thank him for his guidance, his revelation, his direction, his care, his help, his keeping. And this daughter right here, the doctor's wife was standing beside me and I was with Leanne and with another friend and their mother and uh, the little boys and Charles had been with me, had to go downstairs then. There was about eight of us up there. And all at once the Holy Ghost came upon me and said, oh, Lynn Marie, we got to get a hold of God because you're in an awful place in just a little while. It's not many hours. It's not many hours. We got to get a hold of God. And I pled with God for the sparing of this daughter. And I cried and cried and asked God to get a hold and take care. And they were going on vacation the next day and she was on skis. And of course, the wraparound was double because of her being so small. It was double. And all of that, and that ski flipped, and they were going about 15, 20, 25 miles an hour. That flipped and hit her right here. It would have broken open the breasts. It would have taken her life, but because of those four inches of that padding, it hurt her, of course. But what if she didn't have anything there? And he had told me just a few hours before, we want to give him the glory. We want to give him the praise. We want to give him the honor. We want to give him the thanksgiving because of all of his revelations and guidances and directions for these uh, 62 years. I want to praise him for all that he did to me before I even knew him. And with his hand, and we're unworthy. We have a lot of responsibility. I, I have, I've told people 45, 55 years ago that I needed prayer more than anyone I knew. And they said, well, why? You're happy. I said, yeah, but my responsibility is so great. And I am so weak. I'm just a sinner, saved by grace through the blood of Jesus and the mercies of God. Because you can say one thing and it won't be in your heart. Because the heart's deceitful above all things, it's desperately wicked. Now the scripture he's given me is in Second Philippians, Church at Philippi, second chapter. Would you get your Bibles and turn with me, if you please. Thank you, Jesus, for your great faithfulness. We pray for those that need to be saved, those who need to come to you, because as I read the scriptures, there weren't hardly anybody through the ages, just a few that would really follow you faithfully, continuously, consistently, with all their heart. And many of us is just worshiping with maybe 90% or 91% or 92% of us. Even 99.5% is not enough. We've got to be 100% inside of us. And I've been looking for people like that when I was in South Carolina. And I, I said, let's pray at 10 o'clock. And I heard a voice begin to pray. And I, I, I raised up and I said, does anybody in this church know who this person is? And I said, Lord, it reminds me of being with Dr. Carver. Who is this saint of God? And when she, when she finished her prayer, she came up. In the front of that beautiful church, all carpeted, a lovely church, beautiful church. And she said, where did I see you? I said, I've never been in South Carolina before. It was 1956. Not quite 40 years. Another year will be 40 years. She said, but I saw you. I said, you know, I don't want my picture in a, in a periodical. I don't want my picture to appear. I've never been here before. But she said, I saw you. I said to the pastor... I said, this saint of God, I said, this, she, he said she was converted six years ago. But when she started praying right now, the Holy Ghost, I couldn't even see where she was. But the Holy Ghost came right to me. I'm trying to find people that will really do God's will. And while I'm privileged to find them, it helps me. See, I'm starved to find men and women somewhere that will actually do God's will on their own. And here was a person, I couldn't even see them. 
And as soon as it started, the first two or three words, we were together in the kingdom of God. And I didn't know her, didn't know a thing about their four little boys or her husband who's an auctioneer, known for miles and miles. I didn't know a thing. All I knew was that I had found someone that was really doing God's will. And she was talking any louder than that. Here she was. I couldn't even find her in the congregation. I said, where is this? Where is this voice? Who is this person? I'm looking for people who are all for God. And it's, it's the first time they say two or three words, he gets right inside of me. If they're really walking with Jesus. I'm trying to find people that will obey God. Too many of us are playing like, like Hollywood. We play like. You read the Old Testament, you're heartbroken. You're heartbroken. You see how Jesus was when he was here? You're heartbroken. I mean, you are, really are if you walk with God. If you're not, it's just, it's just an idea, just a thought, very serious thought. She said, well, I, I saw you someplace. I said to the pastor, I was in a terrible battle. The powers of hell were fighting me so hard that I couldn't tell my wife or any friend of the severity of the problems of the fires of hell fighting me. Battling me. It's been so severe at times, I wouldn't want you to have to go through it for anything. But God would help us to praise him anyhow and go on as if there weren't any problems. Just go on like that. everything was all right. But the powers of hell would be raging, accusing, buffeting, storming. It was so terrible. I'd just uh, have to rebuke him and resist him and plead. And I said to the pastor, Reverend Bennett, I was there because the mayor of Hemingwood, Hemingway, South Carolina, was on a, uh, the porch of a hotel where I was preaching. That's why I went there. It's because of an old gentleman who became the mayor of Hemingway, South Carolina, and uh, God had me preaching on the hotel por por porch. And he said, to Reverend Bennett, I want you to bring him to our church. Yeah. And here's, here I am with a saint of God that I didn't know ever lived. And I said, Brother Bennett, would you take me and yourself out there for a prayer meeting? He said, why, certainly. So we went out in the country, and she had a big chair there and had a couch, so Reverend Bennett and I sat on the couch. Well, I got down, and I began to pray, and I prayed as God helped me, and the glory fell upon me and revealed to me that she was an intercessor in the body of Christ, and her intercessions would be the prayer that would bring thousands to the Lord in the islands of the sea. And just as the glory fell on me, I opened my eyes and she was walking toward me. And when she was walking toward me, I was receiving the Holy Ghost witness. And she said, I know where I saw you. I saw you at this old prayer uh, chair here where I pray. I saw you in a vision. I saw you in a vision right here. I couldn't figure out where it was. It's right here. While you're praying, the glory is falling. God revealed. I saw you here in my place of prayer. Verse 12 of the second chapter of Philippians. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Seldom have I ever read such a scripture that a people obeyed. He said they were obeying, but they had to do something else. He said, you've obeyed not only in my presence, but in my absence. But now much more in my absence. He said, I want you to do something. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Already been saved. Already been obedient. But he said, you're going to have to work out your own salvation. That means a constant work of dying to self, forsaking all things of earth. You're going, you, you've obeyed, but you've got to continue to work out your own salvation. He said, with fear and with trembling. See, hardly anyone's able to hear it except God help us to hear it. I can't get it across. I can't get it myself except the Holy Spirit helped me get it. He gave the scripture to me. 
Of course, I've read it many times, but he said, I want you to work out your own salvation, not your wife or your husband or your child or your neighbor. He said, you work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. And it's preached that you just repent and you have eternal life. I want you to know the Word of God says that after we're saved, even after we obey, we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And that means that we must not do our own will at all. We must deny ourselves and be obedient and be faithful and be true with clean hands and a pure heart so that we can so please Him that He can condescend to men of low estate. Work out. That's, that's prayer, that's submission, that's inner death. This is the working out of our own salvation. Reading the Word, praying, testifying. When you cease testifying and witnessing for Jesus, you're either backslidden or you're beginning to backslide. One or the other. Whenever I, whenever I do not witness, whenever I cease my witnessing, I'm either backslidden or I'm on my way to being backslidden. Charles has been with me this week and we witnessed to this one here. Witness here in a, in, a, in a doctor's office. This beautiful black sister, she didn't even see us. Got her beautiful coat on, her scarf, and her hat, and she was going. Here I was sitting back here, and I said to her, I began to speak to her as the Lord led me. She turned around as if she'd been a close sister of mine for years. And we had such a time in that doctor's office. But you see, if I hadn't a witness to her, we'd have missed it. Person after person, if I failed to witness to this one, I remember I wanted to take the car that the people got me. I wanted to go to Anderson and get it to looked after in a garage. And the Holy Ghost said, no, go to Greenville, Ohio. I said, go to Greenville, Ohio. I wanted to go over there. But I went to Greenville, Ohio. And there was a man up in the engine. He got on top of that big old Packard Clipper. And he was up in there. And I was there with him. And he said, I was called to preach years ago. I was called, but he was discouraged. I don't know what all happened. You see, a lot of people that claim to be Christian say the wrong thing and hurt people, and they're gone. They're gone. Wouldn't it be wonderful just to be all for Jesus? All for Jesus. I mean really, truly, absolutely. And it's a constant battle if I don't pray and persevere. Well, while he's up on top of the motor, you see, I find out that he's had a call to preach, and I was sent there to love him and try to get him back on his way to Nineveh. He'd been on his way to Tasha, but he needed sweetness, kindness, loving care. He needed help. Amen. I wanted to go to Anderson. He said, you go to Greenville, Ohio. I'd never been there at that uh, garage. That's working out of my own salvation with fear and trembling. What if I'd have gone where I wanted to go? See, most all men since the fall of Adam do what they want to do. Most every person does what he wants to do. He does not do God's will. And if you'll read the Old Testament, he could not find anybody that obeyed him. Oh, dear hearts, our hearts are so hard. They're so self-centered that we don't know it. But through the revelation of Jesus, you, we have you with us. Through the revelation of Jesus, we have Lydia. Because of Jesus' guidance and direction. See, we wouldn't have you. You wouldn't be here if Jesus hadn't told me in a parsonage in 1937 in Richmond, Indiana, when I said to him, Wesley Pew, I said, God wants me at the bottom place. He doesn't want me at Mill Grove. He doesn't want me over at Winchester Circuit with extra money because of an extra parsonage. He wants me in Red Key Circuit. And because I went there, by God's grace, there wasn't any bathroom. I had to go out all winter out in the cold. We didn't have any furnace. We didn't have any bathroom or anything like that. And I, I was there because the Holy Ghost sent me there. And because I was there, I found a servant that led us to your brother and sister. See, you wouldn't be here for that leading. I had to forsake everything. I had to forsake the whole thing in 1937 or he wouldn't even be here. His family, all the helblings in, in Salt Lake City that led me to Sally. She was a Roman Catholic sitting right here after I'd been there. I don't know. Been there nine times. And she was a Roman Catholic. She sat right there. I was right here, and she was converted right there and changed and found Jesus. Oh, how happy she was. And she brought a neighbor of her all the way from Nevada over there who had left her husband, a certified public accountant, and uh, she had left him. She had left him because the seven- or eight-year-old child just died like that, and she is in shock, and she didn't know what to do. 
and I didn't know a thing about her life. She had said to Sally, who was saved years before there, she said, don't you ever try to get me to go back to my husband. But when, we pre- when Jesus preached to me that night, she said I preached as if I knew all about her life, all about her situations. I talked to the women, how they loved their husbands and what they should do, and she was converted clear over to my extreme right. She got on the phone, called her husband, said, I'm coming home. It was all by revelation because I didn't know anything. I don't know anything, but I know this, that God wants us to obey him only and be faithful at all times in all areas In every respect, he wants us faithful and true without question. But you and I can't do it unless we wait on God and the blood cleanses us and the pure truth of Jesus sanctifies us and we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to do what we think is best. We'll not follow him. We will know the Bible by heart. We know all theology, but we won't follow him unless by the grace of God this old man in us is crucified. And it's every second and every breath. We will not be kind and gentle and holy as he is holy unless through his blood applied. It's because of his leading. And he said we're to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what he said. See, that's serious. Working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That's after we're led by the Holy Spirit. That's after we've surrendered. Keep working it out with fear and trembling lest we get lukewarm. Now turn, if you please, over in Revelation. And in Revelation, the second chapter, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, I write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor. That's prayer. That's trying to do things in the church, for the church. I know your work. I know your labor. I know your patience. I want you to see that this was a patient people. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. All sin, you can't stand it. It hurts you. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and they're not. And hast found them liars. And also, see, they had discernment. And that's born, that is, bore the burdens and uh, really endeavored, and you have patience. And for my name's sake, you have labored and you have not fainted. Now, this, this was an awful nice people he's talking to here, but he said, Here, I, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. See, we have, we have people that are saved and they leave their first love before they ever get to the pew. Because they won't obey God. They will not deny self. They will not be faithful to do what God leads them. He said, they had all these marvelous characteristics. But he said, I, you've left your first love. That's why people just sit there. They don't have any fire on their soul. They don't have any testimony. There's no glory on their soul. When Jesus told me 73 years ago, you belong to me, I will use you in my kingdom someday. I didn't know what he was going to do with me. I don't know from one day to the next. I don't know from one minute to the next. I don't know what from one second to the next what he's going to do because it's by the grace of God. We're, We're supposed to go by faith. That's as far as you know where you're going. Right there. Most people want to know where they're going but far away. They want to know all about plans. They want to know, oh no, that's so far from God's will. And people don't know it because they're, they're in sin, born in sin. In sin, did my mother conceive me. I was born and shapen in iniquity. Our hearts are so deceptive. Our hearts are so wicked. Our hearts are so hard and we don't know it. We're not aware of it. You can have patience. You can have all these things that he named here. Have the whole works and yet have left that beautiful experience that we found at conversion. I have somewhat against you because you've left. You've left your first love. We leave by not denying ourselves. We leave because we have our own ideas. We leave because we do not pray 
We leave because we do not witness at every opportunity. See, if I don't witness at every opportunity, I will leave my first love. I won't have the joy. I won't have the glory. I won't have the power in my life. None of us. But see, it, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could convince people to really do God's will? I mean, really. Because it's the fall of Adam. Hardly anyone has done God's will. Only a few in a century that would do it consistently and faithfully and holily, rejoicingly. First at home. If I don't live a holy life with my wife and children and my little ones, here, there, or my neighbors, you see, I have left my first love. And when we leave our first love, we have a cold heart and we don't know it. You see, anybody that walks with God, their cup's running over. They have a testimony. It may be only, Jesus saves me and sit down. A lot of people think they have to make a talk. No, no, no. A witness is Christ has blessed me and sit down. See, everyone that walks with God will only overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And everywhere I travel, I'm trying to find somebody that will obey God, that will do it consistently on their own because God is so great and Jesus is so marvelous. You see, we're so far from God and we don't know it. We really don't realize it. The prophets cried loud. They cried out loud to the people. Cry loud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob their sins. That's what God told Isaiah to do. And he wanted him to do it. But you see, they, how many of them could hear? Was there one that could hear in 1,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, or 1 million? Is there one that could hear? 50 years ago, I'd say, Jesus, how many could hear me in this church tonight? I would say, Lord, I'd tell my wife, I said, how many heard me could hear what God was, I was endeavoring to speak whatever the Lord laid on my heart. How many could hear me in this church? How I, I was, see, no wonder Mary Webster told my wife I was a lonely man. Because when I find souls that will do what God wants them to do, I'm so happy. It helps me. It's by the grace of God I, I want to be saved. Really. It's just for the mercies of God and the blood of Jesus, I can make it to heaven. We've gone into lukewarmness. We've gone into our own desires. And he told those wonderful people that had all those attributes, spiritual attributes, marvelous. But he said, you've left your first love. The, one of the easiest things is to from the time you're really converted, if you are, if you've really been transformed, it's the easiest thing in the world to lose that in the next one, two, in two seconds. Just takes two seconds to lose it. That's all. After you are saved, if you don't obey God immediately, you've left your first love. I've left it. And I could tell when I'm speaking that we're not too stirred up. We're not too stirred up. There's a few. He could even tell me the number if I ask him now. Because he knows all about it. We can't hide one thing from him. He knows your secret parts. He knows your obstinance. He knows that you're offended with me now, some of you. Even some of my dear ones don't care for this. Don't like it at all. They were with Jesus. He didn't have... When Jesus was here, he... He was so alone, he couldn't hardly find anybody. And they all left him. They all forsook him. And after he preached that he was the bread of life, they, many of his disciples, how's many, many? Hundreds of thousands left him and never came back with him again. He said, only a few is going to find us life. He told me that in the next 60, uh, 62 years ago, in the next few days and weeks when I read it. Uh, if God hadn't put it in there, it had, it had leaked out of my life. But, it, but it's got higher, it's got greater, it's got greater. Because we don't know how far from God we are. See, I'm not trying to discourage this. I'm trying to help us to obey the Holy Spirit and to really get on fire, but not fanatic. There is a balance. There's a balance. 
And if we'll do God's will, then there's joy, there's victory, and the Holy Ghost will witness. It's right in my heart now. He will witness. There will be Holy Ghost fellowship when we obey Him. He'll take all the sourness out of us, all the obstinacy out of us, all the stubbornness, all the analyzation, all the abruptness out of us. Some of us are so abrupt, we just bang people and don't even know we've done it. We say things that if they knew what they said, they said, oh my, my, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Jesus preached all day to 5,000 men, and I don't know how many thousand women. Where you have 5,000 men, there might be 1,000 or 2,000 women, or three. And there might be 1,000 or 2,000 or three or four or 5,000 children. He preached all day, and they didn't have any seats like you have. Like I have here, this beautiful pulpit. Preached all day. And did you know people now say we hold the service too long? The services are long. Does that come out of a spiritual heart or a carnal heart? How many of those 5,000 said you've just talked too long? You've talked hour after hour after hour after hour. Jesus preached all day. They, there they were on the rugged mountains. They had no beds. They had any bathrooms. Where did they go to the bathroom? When they, where were they going to hide? And they stayed all night on the ground. And they listened to him the second day, preached all day. And they preached the third day all day to him. They hadn't had any meals. We really can't comprehend this unless the Holy Spirit helps us. I know I can't. And I need a lot of prayer. Much. And after three days of, of preaching, how many of them thought he preached too long? How many thought the service was too long? How far do you think we are from God? How far do you think we are from God? How far can you be and not know it? What distance can we be from God and not even know we're a half inch or a quarter of an inch from where he wants us in the will of God? This is not to discourage us. This is to help us to shake ourselves. To shake ourselves. I mean, unless we shake ourselves, we'll go on in our lethargy and our own ideas and our carnality and we'll think we're pretty good people because we don't smoke or drink or commit adultery or fornication. Because if I'm untrue to my wife, I'm an adulterer. She was for life. I was to take her for life. And here we have this tendency in our heart to become lukewarm, and we don't know it. We leave our first love, and we don't know we've left it. And the only way we know that we haven't left it is by the grace of God that we have joy, joy, joy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We love everybody in all the world. We don't want to find fault with anybody. We don't want to criticize anyone. We love. He said the real evidence is that you love everybody in the world. You, though we speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and we don't have the love of Jesus Christ, we're tinkling cymbals and sounding brass. If I had a pie pan and a spoon, I'd just beat it, and I'd say, that's all we are. I did that in Cameron, Texas in June, July of 1943. This is 95. And I said, that's all we are. It was the most spiritual church I nearly was ever in in my life. In all my life of preaching of 62 years. A spiritual church... I got to preach in the marriage supper of the Lamb and Sister Fuller and Sister... They went down through the tables. They were smelling the food of Zion. Oh, my, the Holy Ghost was all over them. And when I got to that church, Jesus told me to preach to the most spiritual church I ever speak and would preach to. He said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and in ear you do always resist the Holy Ghost even as your father did also to ye. And that was my first preaching to the most spiritual church I ever preached at, as far as I know. Uh, did you ever heard a preacher preach on that? I didn't know I was going to preach on until three, three blocks from the church. 
ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and in ear, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, even as your Father did also to you. And all signs were in that congregation. They were speaking with other languages. There were healings. There was marvelous things going on all over, here and there. Not all over, but here and there. And that's what he told me. Uh, I didn't know how to preach it. <laughs> Would you? I never heard tell of any preacher ever attempting. I, I wonder if any preacher in the world's ever preached on that. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ear, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, even as your father did also to ye. That was the most spiritual church that I'd been to. God was so in that tabernacle that the man up, a pharmacist, he opposed that church and he'd come down and stand outside and he just went down to death. And so many weeks and months he went down to death. Everyone that opposed that place went to death. Jesus told me within two or three or four or five, six, the six days I was there, he said, this place belongs to me. Only that place that he ever told me belonged to him and up until then. Until I was in the garage where our garage is now and there wasn't any building part. I was in there and God was talking to me all morning and I couldn't figure out. I said, Jesus, what are you telling me anyhow? And when I finally got the revelation, he said, this place is mine. That was the second place he ever told me in the world. He said, I have somewhat against you because we have left our first love and we don't know it. We don't realize it. We're not aware of it. We're cold at heart. We're hard of heart. When I preached, you got up and I thought you were doing the best you could as much as anybody I knew in that congregation. You said, I have a hard heart. You told me right there. And I thought he was one of the most wonderful of men, which he was and is. And he says, I have a hard heart. I I, I was startled. Because he'd left the job. He'd left everything. Oliver Holden told me he'd be a millionaire in so many years, which he would have been. But he left it all to come down to a small salary. And we had to trust the Lord just for that. Like we do now. See, I lived for nearly 20 years, and I didn't know how I was going to eat, where I was going to buy groceries, or how I was going to get gasoline for my car, how I was going to pay my taxes, how I was going to get this or that. For almost 20 years, we just lived by total faith, by God's mercies and by God's grace. And I was happy. Jesus helped me. He helped me. He was merciful to me, but he said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love, because we haven't worked out our salvation with fear and trembling. Just repent and give your heart to Jesus, they say, and you'll have eternal life. But the scriptures tell us that we must press into the kingdom. We must obey. We must forsake ourselves. We must deny ourselves. We must be cleansed of the self-life. We must die out to this self-life and do God's will only and do it as a little child in utter dependence upon him. You see, if we could convince men and women of this, then the kingdom would come and he would draw all men to Jesus. See, just as soon as a few people will do God's will. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men. See, all men hasn't been drawn anywhere. 3,000 at one time, 5,000 another time. I mean drawn. I mean saved. But he said, if I find a people that will be willing to do God's will and be faithful, he will be lifted up. And he said, I'll draw all men. And if we would give everything over to the Lord here and not become radical or fanatical, remember, he wants us holy and in divine order. He doesn't want us to put on things and get in the flesh. As soon as a person begins to say something in the flesh, I am so sorry. I'm just so down. And we can't do anything except for the Holy Spirit. But the powers of the devil are strong in the world. The demons are raging to enter into every heart possible to get us cold of heart and to bring things to our mind that's carnal. So therefore, instead of walking with God, we walk in the flesh. And we don't know it. We read the Bible, we pray, uh, we preach, we testify, we sing, but our hearts are far from it. He said, our hearts are far from it. Is my heart far from him? Oh, thee, Jesus. Uh, the devil fights me when I get home, said I preach too straight and, and all that. But I have to just say, Lord, help me to be faithful and to be true, to be kind, to be gentle, and tell the people the truth. You see, unless, unless we're willing to witness 
for Jesus' glory, not in some condemnation way or hurtful way or a self-assertive way, but in a sweet way, in the holy way, in Jesus' way. Can God, he will use you then and use me as we give him all the glory and all the praise, as we keep in balance that we don't go too fast or too slow. But he says, you've had all these beautiful attributes. He told the church there, he said, you're patient. You hate evil. You don't like any kind of evil. You've borne the burden. For my name's sake, you've labored, you've worked, you've not fainted. But he said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That's constant. That's continual. That's the morning to night to be encouraged. Keep relaxed. Don't be tense. It's too hard on the mind. Brings on mental illness. Don't want us to be mentally ill. He wants us to be mentally, spiritually filled with his likeness and careful and kind and gentle and tender and long-suffering and compassionate. This is his will. But he said only a few will be willing to do this. And he said here that we're to do all things without murmurings and disputings. It's verse 14 of the second chapter of Philippians. Then he said a striking thing in verse 21 of the second chapter. He said, for all men, women seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. That stirred me up. I was so stirred. I said, God, have mercy on me. The tendency of all men and women is to seek their own. That's what it said here, didn't it? It says that. What's going to keep me from seeking my own, dying daily, loving everyone, being faithful to my wife, to my children, to my friends, to my neighbors? Or I'm going to drift and not even know. You always know if you don't have the, the, the leading to witness to people that we're either backslidden or we're backsliding. That's one of the ways we know, because we only overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What, 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 is, what is the seriousness of this? You see, if I don't witness uh, to the filming station people or to doctors or to grocermen or to pharmacists, if I don't witness not to be boring or not to be offensive, right. too many of us, when we get started, we offend people by talking too much or too directly. See, what I'm preaching, I have to be so careful so I don't hurt anybody. So I won't offend anyone. I won't discourage anyone. But to endeavor to bring us to the place where we will truly obey the Holy Spirit. And they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. They hearkened not to the voice of the Lord over and over and over. And so I'm weaker than they, except I die daily. That's exactly what we'll do. And not be aware that we're in that condition, that we've left our first love. Well, when I was first converted, I want to tell you, the devil fought me so hard, he didn't want me to testify at all. I had to persevere to testify my first time. I had to persevere the next time. I had to persevere the next time. People think it's easy. Listen, I want to tell you it takes death to witness, but we've got to get the fire on our souls, and it won't come in until we have made all the restitutions. We've asked everyone to forgive us of our impatience, our jealousies, our talking about them, our criticisms, until I get that under the blood and get that out, you see. I must be forgiven of it. I must be cleansed so that he can work with me. So he can lead for his glory, for Jesus' praise and honor. And when Jesus was here, he was brokenhearted. They wanted to be on the right hand and the left hand. They wanted to know who was the greatest among them. That's so far from where we're supposed to be. When we do God's will, we're not thinking about who's the greatest. We're thinking, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm having a great time here, but I'm the bottom one of all. I'm the least of all. Whenever you're walking with God, you know that you're the least of all. You're dependent upon him. He said we're to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Fearing God. I said something I shouldn't have said, and the power hit me on the head. I was in the pulpit at Matthew's, and when I said that, I thought it was going to fall to the floor. I held on to the pulpit and asked God to forgive me. 
And I was talking to my mother, mother and father, and I said something I shouldn't, and I thought she was going to knock me to the floor. Now, I didn't know much about the fear of God. How much do we know about the fear of God? Now, the Bible said that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That means without the fear of God, we can know all, all about everything and not really know what we're supposed to know, except through the Holy Spirit becoming as a child. He said we're to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. Fear of God. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? I tell you, it would be a happy world. There wouldn't be anybody in prisons. There wouldn't be any divorces. There wouldn't be any cursings. There wouldn't be any finding fault. There wouldn't be troubles. There would be harmony. If only we could persuade men and women to obey God and do God's will really, truly. How long have you been preaching like this? As long as I can remember. When I started and I didn't know how to preach, I said, I don't know how to preach. I'd get up there and I thought if I could last five minutes, it'd be something. 62 years ago. And I, the Lord had helped me. Then after I'd preached a few years, I had to pray for grace and I wanted to stop like last Sunday. I wanted to stop so bad. I'd talk so long. I wanted to quit, but I couldn't. I just seemed like I just couldn't. It was just flowing out of me and just coming and on and on and on. And I'm in debt to him, and I know, I know I'm nothing. But he said, all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. And that kind of, that really, what, does that do anything to you? Does, what does that do to you, really? Just look at your heart right now. Look at your heart. Look at my heart. It said, since the fall of Adam... All seek their own. The only way that we can do otherwise is to obey him and testify and praise the Lord and tell the devil he's a liar. <laughs> well, we got to tell him that quite a bit because he don't believe it. He comes back and tries us again. The devil's a liar. Amen. See, he's the father of it. But I tell you, if we'll do God's will, you'll be fought and accused and buffeted. But I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit will be in your life if you'll obey what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Uh, see, he, he said that his children will be led by the Holy Ghost. Anyone that's his child will be led by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says, and I know that I'm unworthy of every leading of the Holy Spirit. From this moment on, it's by the grace of God that he could allow me to be led by the Holy Spirit. Oh, I think it's one of the most wonderful privileges is to be led by the Holy Spirit, but I, I have to die constantly. I've got to die out in the morning and the evening. I've got to die to myself, to my ideas, to my wants, to my desires, and what my family wants, and, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and so many things. There's so many things trying to keep you from the fire that if, I'd, if I could just draw a curtain and let you see it, you'd say, I never dreamed there was such a thing. And see, I wouldn't know this only by God's help because men don't preach like this. Uh, most men want to preach, you know, the best they can. But when you get to preaching like this, it's not very popular with the carnal nature. Not what people, want to hear, people don't want to hear this. To hear. And when Jesus was here, and when Jeremiah was here, and Isaiah, they didn't want to hear what God told them. Right. They didn't want to hear it. Are we any different in the 1900 and uh, here it is, 95. Well, praise God, there's a few in this place that really want to hear it. There's a few right here in this congregation. I want to encourage you that there's a few here and maybe more than I think that really want to do God's will. We just be encouraged. Just don't get discouraged. Now, if your heart's right, you'll take what I say and get it behind you and push you up to the cross. Now, if, you're not, if your heart's not right, you know what you'll do? You'll question it. You'll analyze it if your heart's not right. You will take what I say and take you to a fence and a colder life. But if your heart wants to do God's will, then you'll get what I say behind you and it'll push you to the cross. And that's what we've got to die. Because unless we die, we're not going to deny. Unless we die out to ourselves and to everything around us. I'm frightened when I looked in the eyes and I see that we're carnal. I see that we're, we've got so many things in us, but when Jesus is here, it's that way. 
And when the prophets were here, it was that way. They were lonely. They would go from place to place, see if they could find someone that would obey God, do God's will really, and yet not become fanatics and radical and critical. He said they were to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling because we're not to dispute or we're not to murmur and that we're to be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked, perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He said that people uh, were of a crooked and perverse nation. That's what he said here in verse 15. And I know that in my heart, you see, it'll be deceiving me unless by God's grace I am cleansed by the blood constantly and obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because when I don't obey the Holy Spirit, my heart gets hard and deceptive and wicked and I don't know it. That's not hard. I'll tell you, it's wonderful. It's marvelous. It's marvelous to do God's will. It's what the world's trying to find in pleasures and in all kind of entertainment and and, uh, accumulation of means we're seeking, but the real consolation is when he leads and when he guides and when he directs, when we're working out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Uh, Now, we don't have to work that up. It comes by a desire to do God's will. It comes by the grace of God that we would be willing to be slain of this inner nature that has taken us into its own desires and its own wants and its own likes. So we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and to lean not to our own understanding. In all of our ways, we're to acknowledge Him and He will direct our paths. If we will trust Him with all of our heart, completely, and have faith, because trust, trust cannot exist without obedience. See, if you just keep trusting without obedience, what, what, what occurs? See, we must obey And I know that when I was converted, when I was saved, the Holy Spirit impressed me what to do. He led me uh, soon. And then I knew, and I got blessed for it. And then when he led me the next time, I was blessed for it. When he led me the next time, I was blessed for it. And the ever leading he's given me, it's been, I want to tell him I'm awfully in debt to God. For all of you here tonight, to this morning hour, uh, this very time that we can hear his voice. Because he said, my sheep know my voice, my sheep hear my voice. That touches me right here. It's not an audible voice like mine. It's an inner operation right here in your heart. Right here. See, people think he talks in the inner voice. He, he moves in your heart. He works in your heart. He leads in your heart. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What's in your heart will come out. Someone says, I didn't mean it. Well, it was in there. It wouldn't have come out. And carnality will put lots of things in my heart that grieves God. And I'm not aware of it unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to me or a servant brings it to my attention. It's called of God. But every servant that's called of God is tender and gentle. But he reproves the world of sin as the Holy Spirit does it. And of unrighteousness and of self-assertiveness and of our own wants and our own desires. And so therefore he said, I have... I have been disappointed because you've left your first love. You remember how happy you were just a minute after you were converted? Remember the peace that came in and the joy? Oh, you see, it's so precious to have this peace and this joy of Jesus Christ in our heart. We can't always be on a high, but we can be faithful in the low. We can be obedient in the low. Most of my time's in the low. A lot of people think that I'm having a great time and living high. Most all my time is in trial or battle or accusations or buffetings or something. The enemy tries to fight. But don't look at that. Don't even let it come to you. Just say, get behind me, Satan, and keep praising the Lord. I said to a dear one today, I said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Keep on praising him and praising him and praising him. Sister Black told me up there, her husband I knew in Teddy University in 1934, she said, it's so dark. I said, Sister Black, get into a room by yourself and start praising God. I said, just start to praise him and praise him. Bring hallelujahs and adoration and thanksgiving and glory, glory, glory to God. Hallelujah to God. Praise the Lord. I said, if you get in a room by yourself and praise the Lord for 30 minutes, the darkness will leave you and the light will come in. I came back weeks later and she said, Reverend Helmet works. I tried it. 
No, it was in the 40s. That was in the 40s. This is in the 90s. I said, oh, if you'll just praise the Lord, if you'll just praise him, if you'll just do what God tells you to do and give him the honor and the glory and the praise because praise is always in proportion to joy and obedience. It's difficult to praise the Lord if you haven't obeyed and denied yourself. And me, the same thing. It's just difficult. The devil doesn't like it, and he'll accuse you, buffet you, storm you. He'll try. When you really walk with God, you will be in such battles. Billy Graham was preaching in Billy's Sunday Tabernacle. There were 7,000 of us in there. This is back in the late 40s, early 50s. And he said, you know, there's over 7,000 of us here. Most of us are church people, professed Christians, but, but probably it's just a few of us just really striving with all of our heart to obey him, to do God's will only. That was the essence or the inference. And my wife says it was the only minister she ever heard up until then that ever said that, outside of God helping me to plead with the people for my conversion 62 years ago and plead with them to obey the Holy Spirit. What, what will it require for us to break through this barrier? The, the men that went to the moon had to break through a barrier. And when they broke through that barrier, they had to have so much power to go on to this moon, 240 to 60,000 miles from here. Now, I want you to know that in my speaking to you today, if you don't break that barrier, you have a barrier. Every man and woman in here, you have a barrier that you've got to break through. Just like they had to go through that barrier. I don't know how many uh, hundreds of miles above the earth. But they had to break through it. I want you to know that inside your heart, there's a barrier that will keep you from the will of God. And unless you are childlike, unless you will persevere in obedience and praise and prayer, you'll never get to that barrier. But if you will, you will. If you will praise God and do what God has said me to tell you today, you can break through this barrier and then the kingdom of God will come in this sanctuary. The kingdom of God will come here. If we, each one of us, will be humble and say we are nothing, we're not able, we don't know what to do, we realize our littleness, our nothingness, our shortcomings, but if we will do what God has told me to tell us to do today, if we'll break through these barriers. See, every one of us has got this barrier all the time to break through. We've got to break through it because it'll hold us the flesh in the fall. What we got in the fall, it's right in there and we have to persevere to break through that barrier. Yes, sir. It'll hold us back. It'll keep us from obeying. It will prevent us from witnessing. It'll prevent us from praying. It will pre prevent us from petitioning. It'll prevent us from witnessing faithfully. And that's, that barrier comes right up everywhere we go. We're right in the midst of it. It doesn't want us to obey God. And only a few have ever obeyed him consistently since the fall of Adam. Only a few. I praise the Lord for the few. I want to encourage every one of you that's endeavoring to do this, to be encouraged. And if you're doing it this morning, you can say, praise the Lord. But God's grace, I'm glad you're telling me the truth. And I want to break the barriers. I want not to become fanatics. Too many wonderful people have meant well, and they got through that barrier, but then we went wild. We went in the flesh, meant well, but got in the flesh and grieved the Holy Spirit, and we didn't know it, didn't realize it. So that's why he said it's a narrow way. See, it's so narrow that it excludes all sin, but it's so wide it includes all holiness and righteousness. It's so narrow, it excludes all disobedience and all criticism, but it's so wide, it has all compassion on it, and all obedience lives in it. The way is so narrow, I can't see the narrowness of it. But it's so wide, that it includes all my self-assertiveness, and it's so wide that it will, by God's grace, contain what I need in the Spirit of Christ to keep on this path that's so narrow. If by God's grace, I will be utterly dependent upon him and give him all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. I remember years ago, Jane and uh, prayed that God would send me to their home and John had his arms, was his arms and they were kind of like uh, flesh. Was it kind of like raw meat like? It's an awful mess, my hands were both of them up to the elbows. And, uh, 
Yes, it was awful bad. And she asked Jesus to send me to pray for her sweetheart and my dear brother. And uh, did we get there? Real quick. Real quick? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> almost as soon as she got done praying. Not quite, but almost. I mean, it was amazing I, well, how fast she got See how much we owe God for this revelation and guidance and direction. We really want to give God the praise because we're nothing. And I asked God for my dear brother that had been helping me since 59, that he'd come in and do a miracle in his arms and all that flesh, all the infections and all that was there. I asked Jesus for the glory of God and he was merciful to us. I was speaking at a prayer meeting in St. Louis and all at once God told me that there was a person in six weeks that was near death. And I didn't know what was going to happen. Thank you. I didn't know what was going to occur. On the day before that occurred, I was there at his home with my wife and son John. And we were coming down the stairway and starting through the garage. And I said, wait right here. We've got to pray. He said, why? I said, because God said we're to pray now. And he, he didn't know why. I said, we've got to pray for help and deliverance right here. The next day he was in the explosion. The next day, right where we were, that thing exploded. When it exploded, it took the nuts and the, all those things of nuts and tops and screws. It threw them like bullets in all directions. It hit him here and burned him in here, threw him clear out of the garage and burned him into the flesh real deep. Now, when I get burned with a, just a little burn like that, it hurts me. But when you're burned into the flesh until you can almost see the blood vessels and the blood oozing back and forth. And here he's burned here. And the physicians, he had physician friends, they said if the, you had been turned the other way at 3,000 Fahrenheit, it would have taken your breath into death. Blew him out of the place, shook the building, even the neighbors felt it. But the Lord had revealed it six weeks in advance. Told me the day before we need to pray. He said, what for? I said, uh, I, I, I'm to pray right now. We've got to get a hold of God right now. We need him right here. And in less than 24 to 48 hours, there it was. It was the goodness of God. It was the mercies of God. It was the Holy Spirit. He said, when the Holy Spirit's come to you, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he heareth, he will speak. He will show you things to come. I got up that uh, service in Scott Depot and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to preach. I cried out and all before I knew it, he told me of a trouble in his stomach. And it was Peter Savine. I didn't know it. Three days before that, he stumped over the kitchen uh, cabinets and he said, if God doesn't intertake for me. And he stood up. I looked back there and there he was standing up with his arms crossed like this. Man of about 220, 230. He said, you just prayed for me. Uh, Jesus went into his stomach, took that thing out of him. All the bloat went out of him. When I didn't even know how so much how to speak or pray. I, I often tried Praise to be God thankful for that. Hallelujah. I was trying to be thankful because, you see, he had all this bloat and all these things. He'd been delivered. He was on the boat, you know, when it sunk there in the ocean. And uh, they hung on to those rafts. And those shark came up and rubbed him until his legs was raw many, many years ago. Instead of eating him like it eat some others, didn't eat him, spared him. And then we found him and God healed him then many years later. And after about a year or so, we were at a waiting upon God and I was reviewing how God led me when I didn't know what to say or do. And Jesus reached in and healed him. And all at once when I told that in that uh, precious meeting, Jesus told me he's going to send help to him. I didn't know he was in financial straits. I didn't know he was in financial need. I didn't know he was in problems financially. Because sometimes, you know, if people don't pay their bills, you don't have enough money to pay your bills. And uh, all at once, there while we're reviewing what God did for him at Scott Depot, here we are maybe in Indianapolis or uh, down at Jeffersonville or somewhere, and waiting upon God, he came upon me, and I said, my brother, God's going to send help to you. I didn't know, it just came out of me through the Holy Spirit. When he got home, the telephone rang, and there was somebody that wanted to make a contract with him, and they'd pay him $73,000. Then he got another call, and it was another so many thousands of dollars. And then he got another call, and it was so many thousands of dollars. It totaled 300000 for the year. 
Jesus, we were just reviewing and giving God the praise for what he did for him years before when he healed him. Then he told me that he'd do God's will. He was trying to do God's will the best he can. I'll tell you, if you're trying to do God's will the best he can, you're going to have help that you never dreamed of. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could convince people of this? I've been preaching for 62 years and I don't know whether I, I persuaded very many in all my life. Jesus, when he's here, he couldn't hardly persuade anyone. His own brothers didn't know who he was. How many read that? His own brothers said they didn't know him. Neither did his brother believe in him. How many have read that? Just think of it. Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was God incarnated, but he couldn't, he couldn't convince people. See, we're awful hard and we don't know it. And that's the Holy Spirit reveals it to my heart of deception and wickedness in us so he can get us ready to obey him. And he spoke to me and said he was going to heat him and brought in $300,000 of jobs. We want to praise God. See, it was his revelation. It wasn't mine. I didn't know anything. I was only a vessel. I am nothing. I don't claim to be anything. People say we're this or this or this. No, we're just a servant. Just a servant. Uh, the least one. Whenever, whenever Jesus permits you to be led of the Holy Spirit, you're just so grateful. Oh, you're so grateful. When you come to take blood, you know, and you're working there, and I'm telling you the things of God, and I get happy and shout, and you cry, and we have a great fellowship. Yes, sir. True. God helps us in your office, oh, yeah. and the Lord will help us in the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Yes. Uh, when we went to town together, when you first got here, 19 years ago, October the 6th, and I was telling you in the hospital where the clergy room is and how, where the files and how all this works and works. Right. You and I had such a time that we were so excited. I wanted Amen. to tell my wife and you wanted to tell your wife how God helped us. I know it. He's helped us this morning. Yeah, he's Holy helped Ghost. us this morning. Yeah. When you said the Holy Ghost, oh, that touches me right over there. Over. Oh, I wish I could tell you folks how it is. And it's for us all. All of us. Oh, this is hope to our souls. It's for whosoever will. Hallelujah. Oh, grant it, Jesus. Because when he was here, they didn't hear. When he was here, he was the perfect one. See, and I'm not perfect. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But they couldn't hear him. They couldn't hear what he said. Only a few heard what he said. Simeon knew him, but the people that fasted, Twice a week and paid tithes of all they had. They didn't know who he was. They knew the scriptures, but they didn't know who Jesus was. Does that make you, what does that do to your heart right now? Just take a walk through your heart. Jesus, what does that do to my heart? To think when you were here, we didn't know who you were. For had they known the Prince of Glory, they wouldn't have crucified thee. And Jesus, just by your mercies and precious blood, I can make it every breath, every second, every heartbeat. And I didn't know it was that late. I just looked. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Oh, it is wonderful. Just the privilege of being here. The privilege of knowing and remembering what took place 59 years ago yesterday. What took place on March the 12th of 42? Remembering what took place on March the 21st of 1947. Remembering what God did October the 21st of 1944. Remembering what God did on June the 8th of 1943. To be able to remember. There's older men, they can't remember what they did this morning or last night. And to have the privilege of remembering. It's by God's grace from now on, I'll be able to remember and maintain spiritual or mental balance. I want to give God all the glory because all hell's against me. I don't have very many friends. I have a few, but I want you to know Jesus didn't hardly have one. He just had very few. Could I say that? That wouldn't be exaggeration, would it? And so be encouraged. I'm trying to encourage us. I'm not trying to condemn us. I'm not trying to make us feel bad. I'm trying to challenge us to the place of where we're really willing to not get fanatical, but maintain spiritual balance. See, the whole world is looking for this in things, in accomplishments, in uh, all kinds of entertainment uh, and accumulation. But it's in the walk. It's in the trusting. It's in the following of him. I don't know very much about it. But I know this is best. It's best. It's, it's all that I was born to just do God's will. And see, the devil will fight me hard. And I've got to rebuke him when I get home. And tomorrow and the, and the, the next day and the next day, as long as he lets me live, I've got to resist him. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could convince husbands to be kind to their wives? 
instead of grouchy and grumpy. See, a lot of good men, and they're grouchy and grumpy. They won't talk to their companion. They get upset with them because they're carnal. I tell you, if we could get men cleansed of this carnality, it would change everything. And if we could get women and mothers and wives to be cleansed of this carnality and obey the Lord, I'll tell you, there'd be such harmony at homes, be such joy. You see, a carnal man doesn't appreciate his wife. No, doesn't know how good she is. She's always got to be better. She's got to do more. Carnality in men frighten me, scares me, because we're born with it. It's so in us that we don't know it unless by revelation because the devil will not let you find out how your heart is. He'll blind you to it. But if you'll say, Jesus, help me and deliver me from all this wickedness that's in me, all this deceit, all this coldness of heart, all this lukewarmness, leaving my first love when you save me, take that out of me, help me, O oh Lord, to be cleansed, to be a vessel sanctified meat for your use, then he would. But how many hours would I have to preach to convince all of us? Would it be a hundred hours or a thousand hours or 10,000 hours? Touches me on 10,000 hours of preaching like this to convince persons. Oh, there are always a few. There's a remnant that's trying. But I mean uh, the church, not only this church, but other churches that profess to be Christians. Because you see, we are caught in a net. We're caught in a net. And that net is self-assertiveness, self-arrangement, self-plan, self-desire, self-want. It's a tough one. And we can't break through this barrier only by the help of the Holy Ghost. And then I've got to keep breaking the barrier in order to keep witnessing and keep in the center of his will instead of falling to my own desires. Because my own wants, the flesh in me is weak. I have to constantly die to myself. You say, well, don't, that discourages me. No, that's the wrong, wrong thing. It ought to encourage you. It should encourage you because you are a possibility. Every one of us here is a possibility of doing God's will on earth as it is in heaven if we'll give him all the praise and keep humble and childlike and utter dependence. But a heart that resents, you see, we've got to get that out of us because that's kind of and we're all born with it. And we've got to pray until the Holy Ghost comes on the scene and gets a hold of us and changes our life and lets us really do as God would have us to do. So he said, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you for these, thy servants, everyone in this building, yes. all those that wanted to come that couldn't get here today. There are those that wanted to come very much and they weren't able. So how could I pray that they could be helped? or delivered, or fed, or challenged, or lifted up. But however that's to be prayed, the Holy Spirit can do it. The Holy Spirit can do it. He can. He is able. We're not. We confess our inadequacy, our limitations, our nothingness, our littleness, but we know that we're able to do it. And we pray that we'll not get looking at circumstances and the problem, but we'll look at the promise and get the Holy Spirit as you want to lead us, uh, the precious Holy Spirit uh, to guide us into that which you have purposed for us. You will lead us as we die to self and as we are willing to forsake self, as we forsake all, as the blood is applied and that touches my heart, the holy blood is applied to my heart, to our hearts. I would that each man right here now and each woman would just say, Jesus, apply your precious blood in my heart and take out of me all this wickedness and all deceit and all coldness of heart and all lukewarmness of heart and all desires of doing what I want to do. Because since Adam, most all men born have their plans. They want to do this and they want to do that and they don't want to do this and they don't want to do that. But you want us to the place where we're just willing to follow and to die out to thee and to ourself and to our neighbors and to our friends, to our enemies, to our persecutors, to our loved ones, and look unto thee and give praise and honor to thee. Help this dear, dear congregation. Everyone is here, is here because of thee. 
and we love them all, every one, that they'll not get discouraged, but they'll pray and they'll obey and keep in divine order so we don't become fanatics, that we'll be holy before thee, we'll be true followers of thee in these coming days, weeks, months, and years till your coming, and your coming could be real soon. And you said, who will be able to abide the day of thy coming? We know this by your grace and through your precious blood that we could abide in that day, that we could do what you would have us to do and be holy unto thee in all areas of the soul, the mind, and the body. In Jesus Christ, holy name, heavenly Father, that each one right now will receive courage, that each, each man and woman and boy and girl, young person right now in this congregation will receive in their hearts a, a work of thy moving to let them know that we are really wanting to do thy will. Because there's a lot of people, unless you reveal it to them, they'll just think we're talking. They'll just think we're just another person. That's what my brother thought when I went to the altar 62 years ago last Sunday. He said, well, he'll just start out and just soon lose out like most everybody. But he could see then after a while that we were wanting to do, we were trying, even though we've come far short, yet you were merciful to us. And that we will be encouraged. Each one here will be encouraged. Not think that we've been here for three hours, but think we've been here to learn how to get through this barrier. We've been here to be taught that we must persevere in obedience and in witnessing and in prayer and in humility and childlikeness in order to break through this barrier that's keeping us from obeying thee and witnessing for thee and walking in light as thou art in the light to have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth the small sin. And each one of you that sense in your heart the work of the Holy Spirit would you feel free to pray? Come to the altar and seek the Lord. If you sense the fact that your heart has drifted or have left the first love, because it's easy to do, easiest thing to do is to leave our first love just by not witnessing, by not testifying, by not doing God's will. So just be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus preached and he preached. And he went back into prayer. So let us pray not only for this church, but for all churches on earth, for the peoples that are in need and are not aware of it because it's more than we think it is. And we thank you, Lord, for each and every soul that we will actually be delivered from the inner thing that's in us to prevent us from thy purpose and thy will. And I know it's by your grace that this servant can be able by thy spirit to do it. In Jesus' name, to not leave our first love and to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Let us stand as we sing just as I am without one plea. Thank you. Let's stand But Break through the barrier. The Holy Spirit's working with your heart. Just press to break through the barrier right now. Hold steady. Saints, pray. 
God could have his way. If God's working with you, you come. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Work, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. He'll receive you. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. We'll welcome pardon, cleanse, relieve. You'll be relieved. Because thy promise I believe, O oh Lamb of God, I come, I come. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. What's another stanza? to that. I believe we should sing another stanza. I know it's late, but God's working. We've thy love unknown. Just as I am thy love unknown hath broken every barrier down now to be thine, yea, thine alone, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. The Lord, anything else on your heart, Brother Helm? Should we continue on or pray? Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord. Father, we pray for these. We pray for our own hearts. For, Lord, that at best we're sinners saved by grace. It's the mercy of God and the blood of Jesus, not by our good works and so we thank you for righteousness and we thank you for the power of the holy ghost who's able to break the power of canceled sin able to give that first love back to us we thank you for it in jesus name and help us to receive by faith the work of god at this altar you may continue to pray uh, be seated please we need to receive our evening off or morning offering Ushers, prepare to wait upon us. I don't know if, if uh, Lynn and Leanne, or Leanne's here, uh, Lydia, uh, are back in the nursery. If they are, if they can come, come quickly. I, I want them to sing as we close, Jesus never fails. I believe God would have them to sing that. And so I want them to get ready as uh, quickly as they can to sing that. We'll be receiving the offering. Let me share a few announcements. I know it's difficult, you know, with, uh, to, to go from an altar call right into uh, announcements, and, uh, but it's just the way it's, it is this morning. And so uh, allow me to share with you to review choir practice at 4 o'clock this evening. Please uh, be faithful. Choir, uh, d don't take this lightly. This isn't just a nice little thing to do. This is an integral part of the ministry, and God wants to use the music program of this, of this church. And so I, I ask you to press to be in it and press to be faithful uh, to it. It's a choir practice at 4 o'clock. We're going to have youth meeting this Thursday. I know we said it would be every other Thursday. The more I've considered it and prayed about it, I think we need the continuity of every week. Until God tells me differently, we're going to, uh, we had 26 this week from fifth grade to senior high. Uh, you come, bring someone with you. Uh, they had a great time that God was working, the Holy Ghost was with them. And, uh, and so we're thankful. All those who are working, I've asked Joel 
uh, to 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 really to head up the overall of the youth program. Joel's going to be in charge of the youth program. Uh, Alan is going to be in charge of the music. The, the ladies are going to be in charge of, the, of refreshments and, and social, and they'll all work together. When it's music time, they all get right behind Alan. See, when it's social time, they all get right behind the girls. When it's spiritual time, they all get right behind Joel. And if there's any question, Joel's in charge, has the overall charge. And, of course, he'll work real carefully with everyone everyone, and God will help us all uh, together. I'm thankful for our young people and how God worked with them this past week. I got exciting reports back, and we are grateful for that. So, uh, so this coming Thursday will be uh, a youth meeting uh, in the back. All of you are invited to, from fifth grade through senior high uh, to uh, bring your children, uh, and we uh, will just believe God to help. Girls, come on up so you'll be in place. Uh, up here, just take the seats right up here. I want want you to sing this as we uh, as we close after the. Uh, as a matter of fact, we we might just use it uh, uh, as we take up the offering. If you'll come up and be in place here, God will help you. They haven't sung this probably for two years, but God will help them to sing it. Yes, son. Yes. Hi. Thank the Lord, Ethan. We're thankful. Yes. Congregation, would you stand quickly, please? We've got a special birthday to celebrate today, and this is a real good time to do it. Will you join with me? In case you're wondering, I'm 54. Be seated, please. I know I don't look it. You can gather from that what I mean one way or the other. <laughs> so you don't know whether I think I, uh, I think you think I look like I'm 44 or 64. Doesn't make any difference. All right. Ushers, if you are in place, girls, they're getting ready to sing. Trust God to help you to sing this for us. Jesus never fails. Need two mics? I'll give you this one in a moment. All right, the, uh, so I mentioned choir practice and uh, young people uh, meeting. The service tonight is at 6 o'clock. Let's come, be faithful, be in your place. God's trying to do a work amongst us. Please, please be faithful to the Lord. Please do what God wants you to do. Please give it everything you've got. He'll help you to do it. He really will. All right. Any other announcement? Okay, let's pray. Father, bless this offering and this people. And we thank you for the privilege of hearing this word today. Help us to be faithful in it. In Jesus' name, amen. And just before you play and, and go, uh, one other thing comes to me. Would you please, if you are a guest here this morning, please fill out. Uh, your name and address as a record of your visit. You won't be bothered or there won't be follow-up if you didn't request any, except that I would like to write you a, a, a letter uh, thanking you and acknowledging uh, your visit with us. And if you would be kind enough to do that, we would be very grateful. You may receive the offering. Girls. <coughs> So many souls have tested him throughout the course of time. So many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds. And every one of them will say without exception that they find that Jesus never Even in the days of old, he brought his people through. Then he came to show his love, and he died for me and you. Then he rose again to prove that every spirit.
story had been true that Jesus never Cannot prevail because Jesus never fails. Sometimes this world brings trouble I find so hard to bear. I know I could not make it. Let's uh, be dismissed as we stand together is the word. Stand together. Thank the Lord. We're glad you've been here today. We trust that God will give you help and strength and a wonderful day in the Lord. And be back at 6 o'clock this evening. Oh, I know it's Super Bowl. Why do you think they made VCRs? I believe God allowed VCRs to come into existence so God's people could be in church on Super Bowl Sunday night. Just plug the thing in and get it on video. You're going to be disappointed when you get home and see it anyway. And you're looking at someone who played football through college. So I'm, you know, I'm an old jock. But I, I want to tell you something. It don't, it don't amount to a hill of beans. So come and join us in worship tonight at 6 o'clock. And uh, we trust that God will give you a great afternoon in the Lord. I'm thankful for this word to our hearts this morning. Here's a prophet going, going to the south, going to be away from us. And in his absence, he, uh, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Thank the Lord. We've been delighted to have you this morning. Be encouraged in the Lord. Shall we pray? Rodney, pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this privilege, for this honor, this day. Uh, may we indeed obey Thee. May we take and consider these words upon our hearts. And the very next scripture of that scripture uh, from Philippians is, uh, it is you who gives us the will and the power to perform your purpose. So help, help our willpower, Jesus. Uh, give us willpower to follow Thee. Help us to be faithful, obedient, and true. Bless and sanctify, protect as people go home. We pray in Thy holy name. Amen. Thank you.